Welcome to Wild About Nav and Speaker Series 2021. We are just honoured to have Linda Huxley, Ireland's pioneering swift conservationist, as our inaugural speaker. So Linda has been working to protect swifts since 2011 and she's been a driving force behind the swift mania that's been spreading to communities across Ireland. So tune in and find out why people are so wild about swifts. The work that I started for the swifts in 2011 um, was really um, just one project as far as I was concerned. Um, but it, it did lead to me um, kind of setting up a group, Swift Conservation Mayo, and Swift Conservation Island just became a forum to help communities around Ireland because I wanted to be able to share what I was learning and also to put people um, in touch. So hopefully that will kind of give you the background and understanding um, of, of uh, where I'm coming from. Now, I know some of you do know about SWIFTS, but I want, just for people who may not, I just want to explain the differences or very, very quickly um, between the SWIFT, uh, the Swallow, the House Martin and the Sam Martin, because very often I find people get confused by um, these birds. So first of all, I should say that in fact, the SWIFT is not related to the swallow, the house martin and the sand martin, although it might look like it. Um, the swallow, house martin and sand martin, they're all hirundines, um, whereas the, the swift isn't. Um, but the, the easiest ways um, to tell them apart is that the hirundines, the swallow, the martin and, and the two martins have a white belly. And you'll see from that photo that the, the swift doesn't. It's got a white patch on the throat, but it doesn't have the white belly. Um, and then, of course, the nest is totally different. The, the swallow nest you can see there is barn swallow. So that's a, a, a nest usually in an outbuilding. And you can see all of the chicks lined up when they have chicks, you can see them all. The house martin tends to be on, under the eaves of houses. Um, and the, the nest is uh, swallow and house martin and mud nest, but the house martins is more like a ball stuck to the wall with just one entrance hole. And the most that you'll see of the chicks usually is just the head poking out. Um, and the sand martin, well, that's normally has um, kind of, a, it's a colonial nester and would usually be in river banks or sand banks, quarries. Um, we actually have them on the bog nesting in the turf uh, in, near to me. So the swift is a hidden nester and it's more, mainly urban. So 90, maybe 95% of swift nests are actually in our towns. And the other side, which is very interesting from swifts, is that there is no mess underneath a swift's nest. Whereas with swallow and house martin, as you probably all know, there's, there are droppings underneath. Um, so finding a swift's nest looking for going around looking for, for a mess um is is not kind of the way to go about it um so there's also the distinctive call of the swift and i'm just going to show you a short video of um this is gmit in castlebar and this is um what i'm showing you is the what i call the traditional colony so this is traditional i mean that the swifts have found it themselves so they are nesting, um, if you can see my arrow, they're nesting here and they go behind the fascia board and they have their nest on top of the wall. And the nest is just the, the, um, the little bowl of, of um, nesting material, grass and feathers and so on. So what you're going to see is non-breeding birds that are going up and flying up to the nest sites very inquisitive and trying to locate a nest site themselves. So you'll hear the swifts and you'll see this unusual um, behavior or particular behavior. <clears throat> Can you hear that at all? Oh, hello. I just want to play that again. Is the sound, can you hear this, what they call the screen? Yep. Good. Yep. Okay. 
So that behavior there where they're all flying up to that spot is they're all approaching existing nest sites. And that is often an indicator that there are swifts nesting in a building. There either are existing nests or there were and the nests are no longer available in that they may have been blocked off. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the, the swifts um, migrate um, to Ireland. They breed here. So in my opinion, they are our birds. They do not breed in Africa where they spend the winter. So I feel that we are actually the future of the swifts. Um, they have to have their young here. And if we don't allow them to breed here, then you know we're basically um, you know, dooming them to extinction almost. So um, what they do is they migrate um, in a continual pattern because they're not stopping to rest on the way. They're only, they're flying 24 hours a day and the way they rest is to um, sleep on the wing. So it takes them a few months to reach um, their furthest point. And the, you'll see the map on the right is showing you a bird that left um, the East Anglia and flew down over Spain and it went over the west of Africa. Now you may wonder why has it not taken the straightest route down to the southern Africa and that's because it would be traveling um, mostly over the Sahara and therefore insect life would be less prolific than if they travel over West Africa where there are quite a few forests and wetlands. So when their migration is all about feeding and the, there's a, uh, an area in the middle of the map, this oval here in yellow, and that's over the Congo. And they spend quite a lot of time there, both kind of on the way down and on the way back. And here, the, this is um, this bird. Um, I'll show you in the next slide how they got this information. Um, but this bird went as far as Mozambique. Um, but in fact, the birds just don't, don't just all go to Mozambique. They spend their time over Southern Africa. And you'll see the map on the left is showing um, the breeding range of the swifts. So the red area at the top is the breeding range. And that this is, all, we're only talking about the common swift here. We're not talking about other species of swifts. So all of this area is common swift, but over here in China, they um, have a subspecies, okay? So the subspecies um, actually also goes down to Southern Africa, it goes down here. And the two species mingle. And there has been the question as to whether there might be any mixing and whether some of the Chinese ones may come over to Europe. And we were asked by Chinese scientists to send samples of feathers and skin um, if we had any, um, if we had a, a, any birds that had died. And I did send some, but sadly, we've never been given the results. <laughs> so I can't answer the question. Um, now, they actually, um, the migration, they arrive here, okay, any time from the end of this week. And I'll go on to as well cover that a little bit more later on. Um, but the, and they leave around September, but it's not as straightforward as that because they arrive in waves. So the very first birds to come back here are the birds that are already have a nest site, that are the breeding birds. And so they come here, um, as I say, from the end of this week, and they will spend a bit of time feeding and they usually go to the nest site around the first week of May. And then they'll go through the whole cycle of breeding, but they'll only have one brood. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that as well. And then they'll leave sometime between August and September. It's all slightly staggered rather than being cut and dried. Um, so the information about the, the migration route and, and what's going on is fairly recent. It's only been in about, say, the last eight years that, that we've started to, to find out what the Swifts are doing. 
and the the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology, um, they started to put uh, data loggers on swifts. And you can see on the bird on the top right, that's the, the data logger. So it's not a GPS. It's a little device that um, has to be put on the bird and retrieved off the same bird the next year. And then they put the little chip into the computer and then they download the information. So they have to be able to catch the same bird twice. And therefore it must be a breeding bird. It has to be a bird that has a nest site that they know that bird is going to come back to that nest site. And um, so they did ring um, a few birds in Ireland some years ago. And on the bottom left, you've got Michal Casey. Um, and Michal has, um, as far as I know, I think he had the first swift boxes in the Republic um, in Tupperkuri. And some of his uh, swifts were, um, had data loggers attached. And it's quite a long process. It takes about half an hour to, to put that device onto the bird. And although it only weighs a few grams, obviously it, the bird feels a little bit unsure and, and it takes it a few minutes to realize, you know, to kind of come to terms with the fact that it's wearing an, um, a rucksack. So um, there, I think there's also, I've been asked quite a few times where did swifts nest before they were nesting in our towns, in our urban environment? And we know that, um, that they were nesting in, uh, in rock faces, if you like, and also in trees, in woodpecker holes, and they still do. Um, so I don't think the woodpecker hole thing really happened much in Ireland since we don't, we, well, we don't really have woodpeckers, um, although I know they are arriving. Um, but in Scandinavia, in Scotland, in Poland, there are quite a few um, known forests with swifts nesting there. But in Ireland, we do know that they, there are nest sites in some quarries in cliff faces. So the, the pictures on the left are County Fermanagh in a quarry. And I believe that there is um, a site in Sligo and possibly another site in Antrim. And I think the reason we, the only reason we don't know about more of these sites is because we've not really been looking for them and people have just come across these by chance. But I think there's one in North Mayo near the cagey fields, right on the cliffs, but that has to be confirmed. Um, so where they are nesting is in our towns and in some of our castles. Uh, so on the left there, that's Kinlock Castle in County Mayo, and there are about 12 pairs of swifts in that castle. And quite interestingly, um, they're nesting there with, along with peregrines. And you'd think the two wouldn't mix, um, that maybe the peregrines would hunt the swifts, but it seems not. Um, the, the peregrine nest hadn't, has had no swift feathers underneath it, and I've seen no sign of the swifts being at all concerned about the peregrine. And I think it's because um, there, there's only 12 pairs there, so you're only talking about a small number of birds. And the peregrine can probably find a, a much easier meal, um, you know, than trying to chase a fast flying swift. So he hasn't bothered to try and learn. Um, but I do know that in, in uh, I think it's in Belgium, there is a peregrine that's learned how to catch swifts. Um, and that's in one of the cities there where there are actually hundreds of swifts. Uh, uh, we also have um, Roscommon Castle. And if you can ever go there, I'd recommend it. It's fabulous, the Swift Colony there. And it's in one of the, sto the, the, the stone walls. Um, and then, of course, um, many buildings from about the 18, 1900s, the stone buildings have nests in. And this bit church here um, is in Charlestown in County Mayo. But what happened in about the 1960s our building method changed and we started to wrap the roofing felt around the end of the rafters. So this meant that the Swifts could no longer go behind the fascia board and access the top of the wall where they could use the top of the wall to build their nest. 
So our more modern building methods are really not in, in favour of, of swift nesting. So I mentioned to you that the Swifts arrive um, any time from this weekend around the 16th of April. And you'd be lucky to see one, except if you live in County Antrim. And the two photos on the left, uh, this one here and this one, that is not snow, excuse me. Um, that is insects, um, the Loch Ness fly. And it is absolutely astounding, the, the quantity of fly. And I have been there and I've seen the swifts in large numbers um, and they're feeding on this. So it, it, I know we all have a lot of lakes, we have a lot of lakes around here, but I have never seen flies um, in, in such quantities. So what we tend to find is that they, they arrive uh, and they're seen in quite large numbers on Loch Ness but we won't see them at nest sites until the first of uh, the first week of May, usually. Um, when swifts are here, they consume about half a million insects, um, including midges. So that's very valuable. Um, and that's what I always use as a bit of a selling point for swifts is that they help keep the midges down. <laughs> um, so what they do when they're feeding themselves, they're just feeding a bit like a basking shark and going around, you know, kind of sucking in or, or the insects. But when they're feeding the young, they collect a ball of food, a bolus. And this is a ball. I know some poor soul has actually dismantled the bolus and they've counted about 500 insects in a bolus. So they catch those um, uh, insects and once the, the crop is full, so you see on this bird here, the bulge, and that makes the white area of the throat stand out when the bird is flying around. And you'll see this bird here is approaching the nest, so it's got its feet up. And here in the bottom um, right, the, you'll see the adult is feeding the chick and it's quite scary because it's not a case of, you know, gently giving uh, food to your chick. The chick envelops the adult's head and the adult regurgitates some of the bolus. It usually doesn't regurgitate at all because it usually tries to feed its other chick um, in the same feeding. Um, so hopefully my little video will work here and this is from the, the nest boxes at GMIT which we, we usually live stream um, every year and this is uh, some chicks on the nest and the adults going to arrive with the bolus and you'll be able to see um, what an experience it is for the adult. So there's the adult and you can see the, the chick has its head over the adult's uh, head, its mouth rather. So the poor adult looks as if it's cowering in the corner there going, oh my God, leave me, leave me alone. So it's almost, I suppose, like when you go home with sweets and the kids come running up to you and they're trying to grab them off you. And the adult is now trying to pull away to let the other chick have food. But um, no, you can see that now the crop is empty. So what I um, want to explain here as well is that when you see swifts flying um, and you see this, that the, the throat is swollen and you can see the white, this is telling you that that bird is carrying food for chicks. So therefore it's breeding somewhere. And if you're trying to, um, to survey nest sites and you're not sure if the birds are actually breeding in there, where, that they've actually managed to lay eggs and are rearing young, the fact that they have a bolus is a good indication. If I see a swift with a bolus enter a nest site, I'm sure that it's actually got chicks in there. Okay, so then the feet on the, the swift are very unusual. Um, all the claws are forward facing. And this is why um, they can't perch. They can't perch on a branch. Um, they don't perch on roofs, but they will cling to walls. 
and the feet are incredibly strong. So the claws act like uh, the crampons on, on ice shoes. And I've seen um, uh, swifts clinging onto walls near nest sites for hours on end. And somebody's told me they've seen them uh, clinging on overnight. So they've certainly got a heck of a grip and that helps them enter the nest site as well, that they can grab onto the nest site and clamber up behind the fascia board and onto the wall or on the stone surface and into the wall. So they, they have um, a, a life on the almost permanently of flight and they feed on the wing, they drink on the wing, they mate on the wing. So you'll see on the bottom here, I've never seen this myself, unfortunately, but um, apparently they, they, they kind of cling on to each other and they kind of come into free fall and then suddenly break away and um, fly off. So they're only landing to breed. So this is very important to know all these different behavior, behaviors of swifts um, teach us something. So when a swift chick leaves a nest site, it's going to have to fly nonstop for two or three years because they only get to breeding gauge by the time they're two or three. So when that chick leaves the nest, it will fly to Africa, it will fly back, it will fly around here, and then it will fly back to Africa and it will come back and it's, a, I think it's about 14,000 kilometers to Africa. But of course they're flying nonstop, so they're doing a hell of a lot more miles than that. So a bird that's finding a nest site for the first time, if you put up a nest box and you have a bird take up that nest box, it's more than likely a young bird that's been flying for at least two years, which is absolutely mind boggling. Um, one of what I call the, the facts about the ama amazing swift. So I've mentioned that you won't see them on a wire. So if you see a bird on a wire, it's going to be, you know, a, a, a house martin, a swallow or, or a sand martin, uh, not a sand, yeah, sand martin. Um, but anyway, they sleep on the wing and they're sleeping at about 3000 meters. Um, that figure comes from I, I believe Sweden, um, where they had, where they, the Air Force there did some um, measurements with a, a, a special military radio, radar. But what I have noticed myself is that when you get to around July time, July kind of early August, you'll be out watching Swifts in the evening and some will go into a nest site, but others won't. They'll be in a screaming group in the sky and then they'll get higher and higher and higher and you'll suddenly lose sight of them. And they're the ones that have gone up to sleep for the night. And they could be non-breeding birds or they could be recently fledged chicks. All the nest material has to be caught on the wing. And so if you have a nest with twigs in it, it's not going to be swift. Um, so what you're looking for in nest material or what the swifts are looking for is feathers, grass. Um, in the bottom left picture here, this was um, a school nest box where we found that they'd taken willow, sorry, <laughs> willow catkins and they'd almost put them together like in a garland. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, in GMIT, we find that the, the swifts prefer millennia grass, the purple moor, moor grass. So if you go out to the bog at the moment and you know you've got this long grass that looks like hair, well, on a very windy day, that's in this flat, you know, floating around in the sky. And I don't know where our swifts collect their nest material, but they definitely have a preference for that. And what they can do is they can weave it round almost like thatch. So what they do with the nest material is they are going to make a nice solid bowl for their chicks to, for, to lay their eggs in and to keep their chicks in. So they glue all of that nest material together with saliva. So you'll see they'll bring a piece of nest material in and then they'll look as if they're nibbling it and try and place it and then they'll pause while they generate some more saliva and then they'll work in. Uh, um, so when you touch a, a swift's nest, 
if you happen to touch one that's a, a year or two years old, it's like a mattress. You know, it's all glued together and it's all quite solid. That is unless um, a great tit or something has got into the nest box um, before the swifts arrive and stolen that nest material for his own nest, <laughs> which I have seen happen. Uh, so I mentioned to you that there are no droppings um, at swift nest sites. The only time that there are droppings is if um, there are some nest boxes on the market that have the nest entrance underneath the nest box rather than being in the side. And what happens with swift chicks is that they, um, when they want to do their droppings, they back up off the nest and they do the droppings in the nest box. But if there's a hole in the floor of the nest box, which is the entrance way, they'll do the droppings out of the entrance hole. Um, but I'm not in favour of entrance holes that are at the bottom of a nest box. Um, and that's because chicks peer out of the nest box um, a couple of weeks before they, um, before they want to fledge and they can accidentally fall out. Um, so anyway, just a few interesting facts. Uh, some I may have mentioned already. I, I have definitely mentioned the first one, which is that they won't start breeding until they're two or three years old. They're very, very faithful to their partner and to their nest site. And the faithful to partner and nest site comes into play if the nest site is lost. So if the nest site gets blocked off during renovation work or for whatever reason, it is very, very difficult for Swifts to find a replacement nest site because they have to find that nest site together and they have to find something um, that's similar to, to what they're used to. So it could take them two or three years before they would, you know, find a replacement. So they'll have two eggs. Normally they can have three. Um, and that is especially the case with the more um, mature pairs that have been breeding for a few years. And I believe the odd ones have been four, but I have no experience of that. Um, they don't lay every day. They lay one egg, but then they have to feed for a day and build up their resources. So the next egg will be laid a day later. So there's a day in between each egg being laid. So the incubation of the eggs is three weeks and the fledging from the hatching is six weeks. So this is twice as long as um, most other birds. If you have an experience of swallows or house martins, you'll see that they fledge in three weeks and then the adults carry on feeding them um, for a week or so. But when swifts um, leave the nest, that's it. Your parents, they're not gonna feed you another morsel, you're on your own. So when you leave that nest site, you must be well fed, you must be well exercised, you must be extremely fit. So that's what happens. These chicks get very, very well fed and they have to get well fed. If they don't, they're not going to make it. So they, that is the, the reason for the six weeks. It's because the swifts are on their own once, they've, once they leave the nest. And they only have one clutch, okay? So they only have one, um, uh, you know, one lot of chicks, but they can have two attempts at it. So if they lay their eggs and for whatever reason, the eggs are um, knocked off the nest, this can ha happen for a few reasons. Um, one can be that they're an inexperienced pair. So by just by maneuvering in the nest, um, in the nest box, they can knock the eggs off uh, the nest and don't put them back in most cases. Um, or there can be a fight. There can be an intruder, there can be a fight and the eggs get lost. So if that happens, they can have another go and this can lead to a delayed um, season for them. But they only get two goes and after that, that's it. If they fail on the second attempt, then it's finished. Um, so this is the, um, the year at GMIT, which I thought just might give you an idea of, of kind of how things work out here. So 
birds arrive in the nest box on the 6th of May. The first bird arrives, the second bird can be a few days later. Um, and then they will build up the nest and then they will lay the first egg. And so you've got all the process then of feeding the chicks and that bottom right photo is showing the chick exercising in the nest box. And this is a video of a chick exercising to do all those push-ups and make itself as strong as possible, knowing, <laughs> knowing um, that it's got to fly when it leaves that nest. So I think the knowing is rather instinct. <laughs> So it's quite amazing to watch this. And you see the usefulness of the claws on the side of the nest box so that they can really use it to push and, and strengthen. And this is why nest box size is very important. This is a Schwegler 17A. And I would not want a nest box that has a smaller interior than this box. So knowing the size of your nest box is very important when it comes to the success of the breeding of the birds, because the, the swift chicks have to be able to open their wings fully in order to do this exercising. And also at night time, all the chicks and the adults are in the nest box at night. So if you've got three chicks and two adults, you've got five birds in that space at night. So it has to be able to accommodate all of that. If there's not enough room, then the breeding is not going to be as successful. Okay. So there, is a, there has been a problem um, for Swifts and there was a massive decline in Ireland. Um, probably 46% is probably a fairly good um, kind of guesstimate. Um, Ireland was affected as an, uh, and the UK um, probably more than mainland Europe because our populations were not as big. Um, the problem was caused by renovation of buildings, our lack of knowledge of not knowing where, um, where the Swifts nest. And the other problem is caused by the fact that the Swifts are not fully protected okay by the wildlife act you can um that they're, they're only protected when they're actually in the nest site and if someone wants to renovate their home outside the breeding season there is nothing to stop them so the only time that you can kind of try and stop someone doing something is if the swifts are actually there breeding and this is why the swifts really they need our help because this the nest sites can be lost at the blink of an eye I know that one nest site has gone in Castle Bar in COVID because I've suddenly realized they're re-roofing the building. There's nothing to protect it. This is, a, I just wanted to show you this. This is um, a building in Sligo. There is a nest site in here, around here. You watch this swift. It knows where its nest site is. There it is. It can't get in there. And this is what you'll see if there is um, a nest site, nest sites in buildings and the birds will desperately, all season, they'll try to get in there. There was a good outcome with that building, um, I'll just say that, but, but it can happen so quickly. Um, so, you know, why should we, we help swifts? Well, we should help them because we can. Um, we can provide nest boxes and we can make it work for them. They're a very, very important part of urban biodiversity. Okay, they're part of our built and our natural heritage. And there are very few birds that you could say this bird is really, you know, 90 odd percent urban. Um, so, yeah, I've mentioned about eating the insects and the fact that they're breeding here. This is the future for the swifts. And they've been around a lot longer than we have. And I wouldn't like to think that we are responsible, you know, for losing swifts. So this is the, how we can help them. Nest box projects do work. Um, the, there are external nest boxes, but even better than that, and this is my kind of belief now, is that this is the future for swifts in the long term, is to get as many buildings as possible to build in nest boxes and 
So this was the first project um, that I did in Ireland with building nest boxes in, and it was so successful, the Swifts immediately took to it, and within two or three years, the whole project was full. So we've now been moving on, and so in Mayo, my kind of um, aim is to get every town with at least one building, mostly schools, and that's what I'm focusing on, is to try and get um, nest boxes built into schools. And I'm now using a box called the Woodstone Swift Nest Box Deep. Um, so this is a school in Ballon Robe. This is one in, in uh, Claire Morris. And I'm encouraging this around um, the country as much as possible. So I want this is the new swimming pool in Castle Bar. And within months of switching the calls on, the Swifts were screaming past the building. And now half of the nest, half of the 24 boxes are occupied. You see, it's not unsightly, you're not going to have any mess. So I, I think um, we can secure the future for SWIFTS um, by doing this and it, and it is achievable. You see those nest boxes that are in there, I don't know if you can see the little entrances here. That's there for the life of the building and we know what they're for. They're for the Swifts. Okay. So you must play attraction calls. Um, it, it, it can be possible for them to find boxes without attraction calls, but to be sure of success as much as one can be sure, attraction calls are essential. Okay, so just very briefly on, I'll just touch on surveys very, very briefly. I know that Birdwatch Island have done a, a survey for, for Mead and they've done quite a few surveys, um, but I believe um, that it's our local knowledge that is the future of helping Swifts. So having a survey is very, very useful. It can help protect sites and it can help you know where to put up nest boxes. But surveying um, is only one part of the small part of the solution. And I think the nest boxes really should be first priority. Um, you can find a video on the Swift Conservation Island YouTube channel, which will give you, um, there's a, a talk I did about how to survey on there. And on the website, swiftconservation.ie, there's a survey form and there are guidelines uh, just giving you some tips on how to find nest sites. So the National Biodiversity Data Center has now has a SWIFT portal, which will capture um, the type of information we need for SWIFTs, which doesn't, isn't covered in the normal BIRD portal. So if you have SWIFT info, try and put it into the SWIFT portal. And the information in there is available to everyone. I just wanted to show you here that the SWIFT nest boxes work because I started to put up nest boxes in Mayo in 2012. So we are now kind of 2011, 2012. So we're now say 10 years on and we have increased the population by about 20%, okay, in Mayo. So, I just want to give you encouragement. I'm not, you know, I'm only a volunteer. I just want to show you that this is the way you can really do something positive for SWIFTS. And I'm, I'm there to help anybody um, and share whatever kind of experience I have. Um, and this was the first project I did, which was the, the, the project at Castle Bar. There's now a student doing a research project from the, the nest boxes that we have there, which are live streamed, because we are on the western edge of the breeding range. And you can, re, you can hear all about his um, pre, uh, research and the, the start of that project, again, on the Swift Conservation Island YouTube channel. And Yarek, the student, he's looking at the breeding biology of the Swifts, and he's had an awful lot of help from a lot of people, um, including uh, Dermot Doran, who may be listening now, and a, a guy called John Young in, in Northern Ireland. Um, this is just one little bit of interest. I'm conscious I, I should be finishing very soon. 
something that interesting that's come out of the research is by looking at the feeding and being able to record 24 hours a day, Swift do something quite interesting. This is five o'clock in the morning. And you'll see there's a peak of feeding activity there. So the Swift parents, they go out at five in the morning and they get some food for the kids. They bring it back, they feed the kids, and then they all go back to bed until about 10 o'clock. <laughs> so it's a bit like the adults. This is, this is um, something that people didn't really realize before. Sorry, that keeps doing that. Um, but you can see that's a peak feed. There's another one at midday. And then last thing at night, there's a big feeding happens here for the night. Whereas in Northern Ireland at Loch Ney, the feeding frequency is different. They have a siesta because they've got such rich feeding on Loch Ney that the birds there, they seem to take a rest around midday. So the feeding behavior changes depending on the location. These are some places where you can, where you can get more information. Um, there's the Swift Conservation Island YouTube channel. There's the website. Um, Birdwatch Island have uh, some information on SWIFTS, Action for SWIFTS, Blogspot and SWIFTConservation.org, this one here, they're very, very good as well. Excellent. Those are both based in the UK and they have taught me an awful lot, as has the Northern Ireland SWIFT group, and they also have a, have a website. And I'm finishing now with this um, one video here to show you um, what happens, swifts, if they're on the ground, swifts find it very, very difficult to take off. There's the odd ones that can. I do rehabilitation for any swift chicks that are, are found. And this is a swift chick um, that I was letting exercise in a play tent. And you will see um, this chick is doing all the push-ups and it's trying to take off. Can you see? So they can't take off unless they're extremely, extremely fit. And when we release um, swift chicks, when I release this one, we just go in an open space, um, usually a kind of football field, and you put the, the bird on your palm and hold your hand as high as possible and let them take off with the wind in the face. But this bird was exercising to become as strong as possible. And then I just want to finish with that to say, let's spread the love for Swifts. And uh, this guy on the right, he's lovely. He's a Dutch guy um, and I met him at the Swift conferences. So I haven't gone that far. Um, I don't need to, to <laughs> show you anything. So thank you for, for your listening. I'm sorry, I might've gone on a little bit longer than I should have. <laughs>